What's up coach Beverly Simpson here. Today we're talking all about powerlifting with Solana Lewis. Are you ready? Let's get started. What's up coach? I'm Beverly Simpson, the owner of Beast Simpson Fitness and the founder of PT Profit Formula and PT Profit Podcast. Today is an interview I did with Solana Lewis and we are talking all things powerlifting. She talks about some common misconceptions, including the warm up. In fact, she has included a five minute bench warm up to help powerlifters increase their strength in their one rep max. So I'm going to leave that link around this video. So with Without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and roll this interview. But if you haven't already, be sure to like, hit subscribe, and tap that bell to be notified when the next latest and greatest video comes out. Hi, Solana. Thanks so much for joining me. How are you today? I'm doing pretty good. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm really excited for this. This is going to be so fun. Thanks for being here. Thank you for inviting me on. Uh, can you just go ahead and share with us, you know, my first question right off the bat, a little bit about who you are, how you got started, and who you serve. Okay, so who I am, my name is Solana, and I'm a powerlifting coach. And how did I get started? I'll make a long story short, but when I was in school and college as a sophomore, I started getting into just working out in general. I was looking at people like, Probably Katie Hearn Fit would be a good example of someone who I was like kind of idolizing actually because I was like, oh, like she's like lifting weights to look like this. Like what? Like I had never lifted a weight before. I couldn't do a push up. So I got in the gym and I had a friend who power lifted. And when he saw me like lifting for like a year, he was like, oh, you're pretty strong. So fast forward, I saw him compete to support him and I saw women power lifting. And when I saw that, I was like, my, my brain kind of exploded. I was like, these women are like lifting so heavy and like having so much fun and like the community around it seems so like just positive like everyone was cheering for everyone it wasn't like oh we're against each other so I got into it um like the end of my sophomore year and I just never stopped like I got a coach started doing it fell in love with it um got pretty good at it <laughs> and I think what got me to become a coach which I became a coach only like two years later so I've now been coaching for about four years um, was I just saw like a need to have more female coaching. Like even me, like I've had a few coaches and I've only had men and there's not, in my opinion, there's not a lot of female coaching options. There are some, but not a lot. So I became a female, obviously I'm a female, a powerlifting coach. And I would say about two and a half years ago, I was kind of introduced to the idea of PRI, the Postural Restoration Institute. Um, because I had a coach who was into it and I just started to see like all these powerlifters are always in pain. Mm. Powerlifters are always in pain, like 99% of them. Like you meet someone, it's like a badge of honor to say that my back hurts. Like they're like excited about it. Like, yeah, my back hurts. I'm doing something right. Like, <laughs> like no. And as it's yes. saying no pain, no gain, right? It's Exactly. And the harder you work, the better. And it's like, but it's really easy to get burnt out in this sport because we lift heavy and you need to know how to like actually program properly for it and lift how much you should be lifting and when. So I just kept seeing people like in pain. And since I had this coach who was into PRI, I started getting more into it. Also took Katie's, uh, recently took Katie's course um, in power performance that really helped me too. So now I just kind of started to really utilize like positional breathing drills and how I can mesh that in with lifting really heavy in a way that's not one physical therapy like, um, because that's not what we're here for. We're here to lift heavy stuff. But two, how to lift heavy and just not be in pain by moving in ways that are better for your body, depending on where you are. Mm, I love that. So now, do you primarily work with female power lifters? Um, that is definitely the bigger part of my clientele. I work with both, but I would say my split is probably 80 20 female to men. I see. Okay. So what would you say? Now, I love that you're bringing in these, these new concepts into your work, because I feel like now in my limited experience, so please feel free to correct me, but I feel like there's common misconceptions, which we've already brought up one and we'll go into that. But in addition to pain, I, I am curious, like do power lifters feel nervous or hesitate to train differently than the, than their actual skill set? Does their fear that, Oh, if 
I train in this way and if I incorporate this strength or incorporate these fundamentals, am I going to lose time training the skill? Hmm. That's a good question. I would say I don't think that powerlifters are thinking they will lose time training this skill if they like focus more on, I guess, essentially technique and their position more than just getting stronger. Here's why. The new powerlifter might feel that way because when you're new to powerlifting, like you get the newbie gains. Mm -hmm. So when you're new to powerlifting, you're just thinking about, can I add more weights to bar each session, which you probably can for a while because you just started. (laughs) But I would say once you've been in powerlifting for even just like a year, you start to realize that technique just holds you back. And if you look at the best powerlifters today, like the current IPF world champions in multiple weight classes, you'll see that they all don't, like their form doesn't fall apart when they hit their, when they hit their Walmart max. Mm. So if your form is falling apart, once you get past like 85% of your Walmart max, that's a problem and it's going to hold you back. That's what's going to hold you back. So I would say that once you've been in sport just for a little bit, you'll start to see how important it is to work on position first, then strength second. And the first like two minimum, and this is an opinion, first like two years of powerlifting should just be about technique and we shouldn't even be trying to constantly go for more rep maxes. And I think that's another problem when you're newer to the sport, people are always trying to retest and retest and they have these all these programs that are like linear periodization, which is not bad when you're new. Linear periodization is like pretty easy to do when you're a new powerlifter, but they start to get into this mindset of this is what powerlifting is. 12 weeks, I go up, 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 up. I one rep max, I repeat. I start low, I go up, 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 rep, one rep max. And that's cute for like a year or two. And then you can't sustain that anymore. You can't keep doing that. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. I feel like we also deal to, deal with this in fat loss. Like people think that they're just going to lose one pound of fat, like, you know, indefinitely, as long as they do, like, as long as they do what is written on their program forever. Yes. And it's the same thing. It's like when you're new to fat loss, you will lose it faster. And as you get better at it, mm-hmm. it will slow down and you can't keep expecting one pound a week. You can't keep expecting a new Walmart max every 12 weeks. Yeah. So what are some of the common myths that you think that the powerlifting industry kind of talks about that or perpetuates rather that we, we could use some shifting in people's perspectives? Mm, Okay. Well, I think the first one, even though it's one I kept talking about just now is that being in pain is just normal. Like you're, you're going to feel a tweak here and there all the time and just Mm -hmm. work through it. Like if you work through it, eventually the pain just magically disappears. Like like it wasn't an issue. It's just <laughs> magically goes away if you keep going. I think that's the first one because when there's pain, there's an issue. Mm. And that means we need to assess what is happening. And people aren't taking the time to really look at like their form or like what they're missing. Maybe it's their warm up. Maybe they're not even targeting the right muscles prior to hitting the barbell. That's a big one. Or my favorite, which is why I see the most often, People come in after working all day, probably sitting most of the day, unless they happen to have an active job, and they're in just these crappy positions. And then they're like, I'm going to just go straight to the barbell. (laughs) It's like, great, you went from sitting for 12 hours to the barbell. That might be the reason you have pain. So I would say, like, no pain, no gain is not correct, and we need to stop thinking that. Um, What's another misconception? I would just say that, okay, here's one. People have an idea that something's wrong if you're not constantly getting stronger. I'm putting air quotes around getting stronger. You can't see the air quotes because we're on a podcast. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, um, there are there's times to just do all the boring work mm. and you won't see that your numbers are technically getting higher. And then when people don't see that, they switch the program, switch the program, switch the program. But I call this. And my old coach said this on Instagram like last week, frick around itis, okay? You're bored, so you switch it. You don't like it, it's been 10 weeks of the same thing, you switch it. How about you try doing the same exercises for like 12 or 16 weeks and just changing the progressive overload in it for 12 or 16 weeks. Don't even like, don't change any exercise in it. You'd be surprised how much stronger people get as opposed to, I got to change all my accessories. It's been a four-week block because everyone does four-week blocks. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, me too. <laughs> it's not bad, but the next block may not be so different from the first one. Doesn't mean that your coach did, was too lazy to write you a good program. That means they have a reason behind giving you similar stuff. People like, you know, the four week block, all of a sudden your, your squat was 225 and then it was 250. You didn't get 25 pounds stronger. You're just getting used to the movement. Like you just got used to the movement on week four. You're finally getting used to it. Keep doing it. Mm, yeah, that's, I mean, we, I always say, you know, repetition is the mother of all learning. So and I'm, I'm sure you have some more, but real quick, before we move on from these, I'm curious, you know, so if you are looking, you know, if you're working with a client and you as a coach are noticing that, okay, their strength may or may not be increasing, how do you measure the performance and then decide whether or not you need to adjust the program or they need to stay the course? How do I measure their performance? So I always get a lot of um, understanding of what's going on in their day-to-day life. So for my clients personally, like every single workout session, they had to fill out how much sleep they got the night prior, how much water they drank that day. Most of my clients count their macros. So I know like literally tell me the macros you ate before you came. Like, did you even eat carbs or protein? Like you're about to do a heavy strength session. You need to eat something. Um, are they, is it the time of the month? I get all this information. So once I know that, if nothing on the outs- in the outside world is really affecting you as in like, you're on top of your sleep water and you're eating. And then I'm seeing that like every single week, like you can't even go up five pounds and we're six weeks in. Mm -hmm. Then at that point, I might say, okay, maybe we need to adjust the program. Um, Maybe it's you're doing too much of something that is a weak point. I'm not working enough on like the strong points. That can can be an issue too. Sometimes you see like a client's weakest points you just focus on that so hard and it's like but we need to keep working on things they're good at too and I might just sprinkle more stuff in that they're already good at to help them kind of keep going so that's what I would say that's such good insight I think we forget you know we're so focused on trying to fix problems that we forget that we also need to keep sharpening the saw mm-hmm. it, you know putting our energy on things that people are good at that's true I hadn't thought of that okay um what else are there more I think those were probably the top two things for powerlifters. I don't really, there's probably a lot more myths about powerlifting, but in my mind right now, I can't think of more. (laughs) Got it. No, I'm curious if this has ever come up and what are some of the things that you do in terms of, you know, we'll go back to pain because that was the one that you did talk about. Now, do you ever find that people will only be in pain when they're working on the skill versus when they're working on technique? What do you do? Like, let me give you an example, right? So if someone's working on the bench press, right? I think of benching technique being very different than the bench pressing positions that you need to be on for powerlifting specifically, right? Mm -hmm. And how do you navigate, you know, pain management when you're working on technique versus skill, especially if it's only coming up, say, in the skill, If pain is only coming up during the skill, I would say it's time to probably take a step back and see, like, are you trying to treat the skill work Mm -hmm. as your, like, how I say it? Like, are you trying to go as heavy during the skill work as you would doing your regular, like, bench press for powerlifting technique work? Because sometimes we think they're the same. Here's a good example. Okay, so low bar squat, that's what powerlifters do. We don't really squat high bar because it's not as optimal. You can use more of your back, your lats um, are way more involved if you have a low bar squat position, right? So if I'm like, okay, well, we need to really work on keeping like your ribs down and getting your quads more hypertrophy, I'm going to add in a high bar squat. That's not your regular squats. That's a skill work technique now. So are you trying to go as heavy in a high bar squat as your low bar? Because you can't. (laughs) Like, you can't. You're probably literally thinking in your mind that squats and squats and squat, and it's not. The front squat's different from the high bar squat, different from the low bar squat, different from the safety bar squat, different from the the camber bar squat. They're all so different. You're probably overshooting. (laughs) Mm, Yeah. No. Okay. Yeah. I, I totally, I absolutely hear that and see that. I see that a lot. And honestly, I see that with me too. Like, I'm like, oh yeah, squat is a squat is a squat. Mm-hmm. Like, and I even put, I put this on my Instagram yesterday. I was like, oh, doing boring skill work. I was doing like two 45 pounds, 245 pounds on my high bar squat for sets of four. 
But meanwhile, I had just done 290 for low bar squat sets of four, like four days prior. It's a very large difference. I can't do 290 for four in a high bar. I would have crushed my, my spine. Like I couldn't do it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I totally didn't. I didn't even think about it in that way. That's awesome. Uh, so I'm also curious too about, uh, do you work primarily with with powerlifting athletes or powerlifting beginners? I feel like there's a difference between people that are just new to the sport versus people that are, you know, competing. Both. Um, I, re- I would say my bigger clientele at the moment are people who are about to do their first meet. So like, they're essentially like, I'm becoming a powerlifter now. Like I'm about to be rewarded the name powerlifter by getting on the bar on the platform. Um, but I definitely do have those clients who have been competing for a couple of years already. So they're already essentially an athletic powerlifter and I'm just going, getting them to keep going, getting stronger, stuff like that. So, but definitely my bigger business right now is beginners who are about to get underneath the bar on the platform for the first time. Mm-hmm. So now you did mention this, cause this is cur- I'm curious because I, I don't know, but I'm curious because I know there's a difference between, there's a big difference between hypertrophy and, and strength training and, you know, training that central nervous system, essentially when you are bringing someone into a, a meet, you know, how do you, how do you create your program so that you are focusing on building strength? But what if you also need to do hypertrophy? How do you typically set up your programs? So that's not crazy hard, actually. And it, it used to be something that I was like always trying to battle between like, do I do hypertrophy with the strength work? Do I do both? Does it have to be a just strength block? Like everything sets to four to six, nothing else. Even your plank is four seconds long. Like, <laughs> um, <laughs> And I would say like, it's easy. It's easy to blend both. So when it comes to you getting closer to a meet, then we're definitely going to do lower repetition for your main lifts. But also, hy- I believe this hypertrophy and strength can be combined in this way. I could have you do 10 sets of doubles. Now that's a lot for a powerlifter, right? We did 10 sets. We didn't do a ton of reps, but we did 10 sets. That's still high volume work when you actually add up the amount of sets we did, right? So I might, as they're going on, increase like the amount of sets, decrease the rest time, but not necessarily have them do high repetition. And as a powerlifter, we are still, that's still working high volume. But then I might pair that with some more like actual high repetition work for their accessories. And now we're in a, we can still call that a strength block, but we're still getting in a lot of hypertrophy. If you're really close to me, feel like if you're like less than six weeks out, we're probably just doing everything low rep, even your accessories. Because at that point, like we don't need to focus on like getting your muscles bigger right? Like hypertrophy work, like it's great because we can work on technique under fatigue. And also we can literally try to grow our muscles. But like right now I'm trying to get you ready for the platform. So once you're six weeks out, it's like, let's just work work on great technique for very low rep work. How do you manage, you know, even hearing you talk about like preparing for the, the meat, my heart gets a little like, how do you manage the, you know, anticipation, the adrenaline rush that people are feeling in their training as they prepare and get ready for a meet? It's always fun. And it so depends on the lifter and the environment that they have. I would say, I always say you're lucky if you're able to go to a powerlifting gym, right? Because you're going to have that community in the gym itself. And, you know, Powerlifting is such a community-based sport that if you're in the powerlifting gym, everyone's cheering you on. Everyone's going to know, like, when your meet is. And everyone's going to be like, okay, like, let's start to, like, let's all stare at her when she does her heavy singles so she'll know what it's like when she's in front of people. Like, seriously. Um, so I was like, honestly, I personally don't have to do a ton besides remind them that they need to make sure that they are, are like, getting the correct, correct commands in their training. So, like, when I say commands, I mean, like, when you're on the platform, you get commands for the bench press. Like they'll say starts and then you start. It hits your chest. You can't move it till they say press and then you press. You push it up and you can't rack it till they say rack. So I have to be like, don't forget to get a friend and get them to say these things to you because if you have never practiced your commands, 
and it gets to the platform and just like start benching and you're not going to remember it like <laughs> it's very different also it's small things like this a lot of gyms have like their uh, regular gym at least will have the squat rack facing a mirror right mm -hmm. you don't realize how different it is to squat not facing a mirror for the first time it's so weird like you're going to be facing people you're going to be facing like 100 people instead <laughs> So if possible, stuff like that, I'll be like, is there any way literally that you can have them like turn the squat rack so you can like face a different direction, which sometimes possible. If you have a regular competition rack, you can just move it super lightweight. But if you're stuck in a, comp a regular gym, okay. Um, I'll just remind you <laughs> that it's gonna happen. So get mentally ready for it. Can you close your eyes? Not a good idea. <laughs> in my opinion uh you're about to do a load that is pretty heavy <laughs> wouldn't <laughs> recommend practicing it closing your eyes plus literally you might like like remember when you're doing the actual um competition you have to stare at the judge because the judge is going to tell you when to go and stop so <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you're right you're right and that yeah. might probably be really scary <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I might also have it's so many small things too like uh, people who say I need my music to hype me up okay, well, you're not going to have music. Well, you'll have music going on in the background, you know, when you compete, but like, you can't be focused on music. So that might be like, you got to cast your music for like four weeks and see what it's like to lift without music. Cause you're just going to hear people yelling and something in the background. Mm. So you can't always squat to freaking rock music every time. And then you get up there and there's no rock music playing for you. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. Uh, I'm also curious, you know, how often, cause you did mention this, you said, you know, in your programming, you can't just keep testing your one rep max, your one rep max. So how often do you actually test it? And then how close to the meat do you get? And, and, you know, do you practice the lift before? And it sounds like it sounds silly, but when do you practice your last, like, this is what I'm going to compete at? No, that's not a silly question. That's a great question. Uh, the first question you asked was, how often do you test the one rep max? So depends who I'm working with, but pre-COVID, let's talk about pre-COVID, <laughs> when yeah. there are way more meets options. Um, if you told me that you that you wanted to compete at least twice in the year, then I'm only going to have you do it at the meet. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. So people go into their meet not even knowing if they're going to be able to lift it up? Yeah, absolutely. I want you to go to that meet and do a number you never hit. Absolutely. Um, and, but, you know, right now, so let's, I'll say this, I got some clients who are literally some, like three or four. They're all going to compete. Like this happens to be right when COVID hit. Mm -hmm. So now I'm having them test it out now because we were like waiting and waiting and wait. Now they're going to test it because it's been like six months. <laughs> it's like, let's just test it for fun. Um, but if it was like regular times, like if you're going to compete at least twice in a year, then you're only going to test it at the meet. And for me personally, I only ever test at meets. I'd never, ever test it outside the meet, but I will have you do a heavy single RPE nine a few times beforehand. RPE nine, meaning you could have done one more rep. So, and that's a pretty big difference though. Like my RPE nine, let's say going off my last best squat, my last best squat was 375, but RPE nine for me might be like 350. That's a pretty big difference between that and my one rep max. So I'll have you go pretty close to it, but not past like 93%. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a big difference, 350. I mean, I thought you were going to say something more like 370, 375, not, no, big difference. But Unless it's we got way stronger to the point where 370 flies like RPE nine, that'll be a good day. <laughs> yeah oh okay okay i just you know for you know it's it's interesting because it seems like rp you know rpe9 versus our you know one rep max it feels like it's close difference but not it's really. not because rpe9 at least for powerlifters and what i use the scale for means you could have done one more rep that's now we're going one rep maxes that's a big difference between i could have done one more whole rep and i had to grind out this squat and i barely stood up and i saw jesus christ on the way up too like that's very different and i don't want to forget your last question too you asked me how close to me do i have them do like um a heavy rep so i will have most of my clients depending on how long they've been competing. So let's talk about a client who have had for like a year doing their second or third meet. I'll have them do their starter 
So their first attempt, you get three attempts in parallel, I think for each one, they'll do their first attempt like five days out. So they're very confident about their first attempt for each squat bench and deadlift, but that has nothing to do with second and third attempt. Got it. Now, how many days of rest do you give them, if any, before they compete? All depends on the person. So it depends how strong you are. So we're still talking my more beginner lifters, only about 48 hours. That's it. Um, nothing crazy. But let's put this in perspective. Let's say I have a male lifter who's been competing for a few years. And let's say he's like Ray Williams. He, Ray Williams is the best in the world heavyweight. He squats over a thousand pounds and weighs 400 pounds. Okay. Ray Williams gonna need like a week. Okay. Squatting a thousand pounds is ridiculous. You need to recover. So if you're going to do like your starter, your, your one, uh, your, what's it called? Your first attempt um, to test it out, like before the meet, you're going to need to recover from that. Cause that's such a heavy attempt. He's going to need like a week. My female lifters weighing 145, 138, um, who have only been lifting for a couple of years, like you can recover in 48 hours. Plus, I'm not going to have you do like something crazy heavy 48 hours out. You didn't do your, you haven't done your starter since five days out. Your starter shouldn't be crazy heavy because I want you to hit something really heavy on game day. So you're good in two days. Mm. Ooh, you go my heart I'm like oh my gosh it's like my meat's coming up I've never power lifted before in my life so that's okay <laughs> um okay so now I love that you're bringing this up too because speaking of this you know I think this is a good transition because we were talking about the differences between male and female power lifters and so I'm curious because I feel like when I just for me when I first started if I thought of a male dude who's like short and stout essentially like big like to me and this is totally stereotypical like do not you know this is just like i'm i'm just saying in my mind i had always envisioned that it was like a really big dude so how do you like do you have to overcome that so powerlifting was cool about it. It has changed so much in definitely the last three years where it's gotten way more popular. For example, the difference between nationals for USAPL, the biggest federation that exists right now, between three years ago and last year before COVID was, I think it tripled, like the amount of people competing tripled. Wow. So I don't, don't ask me for the numbers, but the fact that it tripled at the biggest meet of the year is pretty big deal. So it's getting way more popular and it's now kind of popular to be an aesthetic powerlifter, which is such a game changer. How do I know it's popular? Because the world champions in every single um, weight class minus like the heavyweights, they're all pretty aesthetic looking. No one's really like, you know, a super large person using their gut to help them get out of the hole for the squat. Like it's so different now. It's so different. So it's pretty cool. Is that a term that people use, aesthetic power lifter? Like that they, is that a term? Yeah. Or people call it, what they call it? Power building. Power building. Oh yeah. Wow. <laughs> no, I hadn't, no, I hadn't thought of that or I hadn't heard that. So that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Because I feel like that's kind of one of those things that you'd have to overcome, especially for a new, like if a new power lifter, right? A new one, someone who was new interested in, they're like, yeah, this looks so fun and I want to participate, but I don't want to get that belly gut. I don't want to get the power lifting gut. And it's, what's cool too is now that like people are at least getting more educated about like nutrition, whether it's good or bad, because there's so much information out there about nutrition. Um, at the end of the day, like what, how big you are is about what you're eating because you can be extremely strong and very small and the reason people are starting to get that now is because you have even like the best in the 63 and 72 weight class for women which are like the two most popular weight classes even though they just changed the weight classes as of this month which is crazy anyways um they're very like they're not big people they're aesthetic they have a lot of muscle and not a lot of body fat like strength has nothing to do with being big that's just bodybuilding. That's a whole other sport. And bodybuilders aren't powerlifters. That's another thing. People in their mind who don't actually compete think they're the same sport. So they think of a bodybuilder and think, oh, I have to either be um, a overweight man <laughs> or like I have to have veins popping out my forehead and popping out my calf. And it's like, no, 
those are different sports. Like you can be small and strong. You don't get big off of just being strong. You get big off of eating a ridiculous amount of food. And that's all. <laughs> Well, and that's also, you know, a big misconception. I feel like so many people don't really understand, which we did talk about is that strength and hypertrophy are different. You can, like you said, train them both at the same time, but they are different. Mm-hmm. And it's crazy. Cause like the, the average person who sees me and they find out I'm a powerlifter, they're like, you're a powerlifter, but like, you're, you're like a regular looking person. I'm like, yes, I am. <laughs> yes, I am. Thank you so much. I appreciate that compliment that I don't look like an alien to you. Totally not. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's a whole nother podcast, which I will do. Is that all those misconceptions about like image and the look of a body? Or you know, it's just very different. It's not like your body's not a business card. You can't look at somebody and know what they do, both in their sport or whatnot. So that's a whole nother thing, but mm-hmm. important to know. But you know, we're starting to go down this difference between power, you know, between male and female. I think one of the things, and I'm curious, because I know that you're also in power performance. And so I know this comes up, but females have, you know, that, uh, I feel like a lot of power lifters will say like, oh, female specific will be like, I peed on the, on the platform. I must've done it well. Right. Yes. when that's actually a sign of pelvic floor dysfunction or, you know, that your pelvic floor couldn't handle that load. I'm curious, do males have the same thing? Um, if they have it going on in powerlifting, I don't think I know about it. <laughs> and that's because they're lucky because they don't have female anatomy. So you're not going to see them pee on the floor. I've never seen one of them pee. But I will say this. Actually, I can take that back. I will say this. I've heard the horror stories of pooping your pants while doing for your heavy deadlift as a man. And that's probably a pelvic floor problem too. So management. It's pressure management, right? And so and females have the their anatomy is just that there's a hole there. Jill and I had talked about that on our our previous podcast. So Mm -hmm. Oh, but it's interesting is that people will usually, just in my experience, they're like, I did it. That's a badge of honor. Yeah. And it's not because, you know, at the end of the day, like you're, you're peeing your pants while you are lifting for the deadlift or like coming up from your squat. And like when you're coming up from your squat, like your pelvic floor should actually be contracting. So if it's so like, if the pressure is pushing it down when it should actually be contracting it's doing the opposite like you literally it's doing the opposite of what it's supposed to do Mm. (laughs) so people just don't a lot of people don't understand that it's an issue and they don't really address it I for especially for my females I try to address it with um a lot of my video analysis and it's funny because they don't everyone assumes they don't have a problem because like in training they're not piss peeing their pants, really. Sorry, I almost said something else. You say piss, that's why. <laughs> In training, you're not really peeing your pants. Sometimes they do, but not my clients. So when I talk about it, they're like, but I'm fine, I'm fine. Like there's no pee coming out. I'm like, okay, but you still need to kind of think about like when to contract and when not to contract because when it comes to game time, you want it to be like something you don't have to think about. Like when you get on a platform, you can't be thinking about, let me make sure I like contract it on the way up when I'm squatting. Like you're just like, Jesus helped me get this weight up. I've never touched it before. Um, and I have a hundred people staring at me. I'm just trying not to break my spine at this point. Like, <laughs> so I think it's something that's important to be addressed in training and to have them have to think about it, especially when they are doing like lower um, intensity stuff. So maybe like, let's say, 65% of the warm-up max for like multiple sets of like higher rep that's like easier time to think about it because that's not such a heavy load you can't just have people think about it like before they get on the platform like hey don't forget contract here and <laughs> like yeah. exhale here like no <laughs> do you feel like people you commonly address this like is this something that people often talk about or do you, would you say this is unique oh they they hardly ever talk about it like especially in powerlifting they have no idea that's a problem because it's so common. Mm-hmm. It's okay. so common. So people are always like, oh, whatever. Like if you've ever seen a product of me, you'll see there are people who literally 
everything is volunteer, so they're not hired, but their job for the meets is when a girl pees themselves, you have to spray and wipe. That's their job. They stand there with rags and spray, and their job for the meets <laughs> is spray and wipe. There's a designated person for it. That's how common this is. <laughs> you know, it's, you know, it's, uh, you know, I don't, uh, while I'm not a power lifter, I'm a mom, right? And so I feel like moms do, you know, we deal with the same thing when it comes to pelvic floor stuff, because they just think, oh, this is normal. It's supposed to happen. Like, haha, scary mommy's joking about it. Mm-hmm. So it must be real. And you're like, wait, but mom, you're three years postpartum. You shouldn't still be peeing in your pants. You don't need to be peeing in your pants. I hate saying that word shouldn't, but it's more like you don't need to be just nobody really addresses it. So I can't even, so I'm, you know, I was curious if you're not even addressing it in the mom, you know, mom world, are they addressing it in the powerlifting world? No. And there, that needs to change. Yeah. Yeah. And like, I don't have enough clients to uh, be the one who like makes it so well known for the world. So I got, we got to figure out a way to make that like just something that's easy, accessible. Cause I'm like, I can tell all my clients not to do it, but that's, 0.0001% 0.0001% of the powerlifting world. Yeah. Yeah. That, you know, I can imagine, I can imagine. So it, that's why this PRI work and that's why your work is so important. I think, uh, what other, you know, so for me, the pelvic floor is a, like the big, one of the biggest differences. What else would you say in terms of, you know, female powerlifting, would you say is different? Hmm. Um, I would say just the way that they left lift during their time of the month, which is funny because for me, I assumed that whenever it was someone's time of the month, they'd be weaker. And I've actually kind of seen the opposite a lot. <laughs> during time of the month, they're not weaker, but maybe the week before when they're PMSing, they're weaker. Mm-hmm. And so once I start to continue to see a pattern of like, there's a week where I may have put the intensity to be higher, but they don't do like, they don't actually get to a heavier load. And then I start asking questions about the time of the month. I'm like, okay. And then I can actually address the training and be like, maybe I'll make it so that like you do more deload weeks the week before your period. And then the next week's a more intense week, like maybe even on your period, but you're good to go. I just keep seeing that like on the period, they're okay. But right before they're just weak and like more fragile. (laughs) Mm, Yeah. Well, and I'm also curious because during the time of the month, we also produce relaxing. Mm -hmm. Do you have to, do you, do you have to navigate that? I personally have not had to really, because it kind of seems like most products are essentially in the mindset that I'm going to push through anything. <laughs> so I don't see a massive difference during the actual week mm-hmm. or a, 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 a negative difference during the actual week. But like I said, I keep seeing it more the week before. So mm-hmm. I just really, I really try to prep them. I try to change up the whole week before. I see what they're like during their actual period. <laughs> and if they can continue to do like a higher intensity on that week, now just keep it like that. But everyone's different though. I've had some people who did actual week of like, I had to change it and make it more less intense. Mm-hmm. As a person. <laughs> mm-hmm. Now, have you ever worked with any pregnant, pregnant uh, power lifters? No, not yet. That day will come. And what's funny about this question is that I was talking about this with two people from Empire Performance like maybe two weeks ago. And I was just showing them pregnant powerlifters who are high, high level, like have gone to Worlds, which is the highest competition before, who are currently pregnant. And what I am seeing, they are not changing their training. Like I'm talking like putting on the belt 16 weeks in, like you, like the belt is something to help you manage pressure, right? So you're pushing into the belt. Mm-hmm. I just don't think that's ideal <laughs> to be doing when pregnant. So I think that a lot of pregnant powerlifters don't understand that training should be adjusted and you mm-hmm. shouldn't be doing like RPE nines, <laughs> but I keep seeing it. But I personally have never worked with someone who's pregnant yet who was a powerlifter. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of the reasons relaxing made me think about it is because what, that's one of the things that we overproduce so that we can become essentially hypermobile. And so we have to be careful when we're training in certain positions because you can actually over 
you think you can do it, but you can't really, your body is not ready for it. Um, but, and, but to your point, to your point, anyway, to your point, the, the athlete brain to me, when I hear you talking about it, like that's the athlete brain. And I feel like power lifters, crossfitters, people who are really highly competitive deal with that, deal with like that question of, I can do it, but should I do it? Is that, is it really good for me to do that? Because when you're pregnant, your your pressure management completely changes. So that's hard. That's a hard thing to navigate. But, you know, and aside from that, I'm just out of curiosity. Have you had to deal with that even with people that are not pregnant? you know, wanting to run before they can walk because they're just so excited. Absolutely. Um, I think I'm seeing it a lot right now because like I launched a new program recently and I launched it literally like six weeks ago. And so I have a lot of people who are like, I'm ready to run. I'm ready to do the heaviest way possible because my technique's getting changed and it's getting better because I'm working with you. I'm like, that's great. No, wait, come back. Like, listen to me. Let me give you... (laughs) Yeah, the actual loads to use. And that's why when I have newer powerlifters, I can't just go by the RPE scale because RPE is like, in my opinion, RPE is for advanced lifters because you don't really know if you're doing RPE seven, like, could you have really done exactly three more reps? That takes years and years of lifting to really know your limits. And when you're newer, you just, you just don't, you might think you do, but you don't like they, they either drastically overshoot or way undershoot and I'm like you could have done 12 more but you call that RPE like eight right so I just have to give them like an actual number alongside the RPE I'm like hey the goal is RPE seven right but you have an option to do between 100 to 110 pounds like you don't get that much of an option it has to be within this little bubble because I know (laughs) that if you surpass this you're over the RPE and now you're just trying to lift as much as you can and we're not on the platform so why are you trying to listen as much as you can? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, for sure. For, yeah, I, I would. I get that. I feel like that'd be me. That's something I do. I'd be like, okay. oh yeah. <laughs> and it, it's still partially sometimes me. Like I started with a coach more recently because uh, when COVID hit, like my training got a little wonky, and I'm like, great. And he's like, cool. Like don't forget, you aren't on the program, so we're doing a lot of RP six. And I'm like, okay, I did RP six, and I almost had to grind out the last rep. He's like really Solana. I'm like, um, yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, I'm also, I'm also curious. Uh, do you, do you work with people or do people power lift when they, and not compete? Like just because they, you know, love to do it. Yes. Yeah. I do have some people like that who they think the sport is fascinating. They're like, I want to get really strong and squat bench and deadlift. Mm -hmm. but like their goal is not necessarily to go on the platform so I'll I'll I'll, like add in other stuff too I like that because I get to play more around with their accessory work Mm -hmm. I can give them stuff that's like more healthier movement patterns Mm -hmm. and not just focus so hard on like the actual competition lifts Mm -hmm. very different so I like that and I do have some clients like that Mm, that's fun now how do you work the the cardio like how do you work cardio or or aerobic capacity into your programming for power lifter who's getting ready for a meet it was so much fun I love it so they all have an active recovery day well most of them have an active recovery day at the least right and I got a lot of my techniques from Joel Jameson Mm -hmm. and his book ultimate MMA which I think every single trainer in the world should read And I love that he talked about techniques where you can work on their aerobic capacity to help them um, get more endurance in their fast twitch fibers, right? Mm -hmm. So like HICT, high intensity continuous training, HIRT, high intensity resistance training. These are ways of training that are not necessarily go run the treadmill for an hour. It's like, how can I use a sled or a bike or a versa climber or even a step up and make it into an aerobic capacity training, but I'm not like running for an hour so stuff like I use those two HICT and HRT a lot Mm -hmm. um and that's mostly what I do for them and also on top of that for overall health I give them a step count goal daily to try Mm -hmm. to hit because you know they forget to move they like forget that movement outside the gym is okay (laughs) it's okay to do too especially now especially now during COVID I was just Mm -hmm. Today, for me personally, it's really, I've had, I've noticed my steps have just gone way down because you have to make that conscious choice to go and do it. Yep. Like they're now getting up every hour and walking around the house. Like I'm like, y'all need to move a little bit more. 
Yeah, no, that's for sure. That's a real thing. Okay, I got it. I'll do it. I'm going to do it, coach. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh. Do you get power lifters that push back on your aerobic, uh, aerobic training? Not so far. Okay. No, not so far. They actually enjoy it. Cause most of the time they come to me from doing a program that was like a regular program that they like bought online and none of it's included. And so what's cool about the training is that it's very different. Like they probably never did like one rep of a step up every three to five seconds for 10 minutes. It's kind of monotonous, but it's different. So they're always kind of excited to try it out. Also, once I tell them like the benefit of it, like literally you have some powerlifters who are so detrained aerobically that they do a set of like five squats and they, they have to rush for like five minutes, but the RP wasn't that high. And you're like, yeah, you need to um, shorten that rest time. It's a little too long. Remember on meet day, you might only have five minutes to your next squat. And if you can't, um, recover from that quickly, then you're not going to have a good second or third attempt. So once you tell them that and you put it in their mind, like, oh, this is going to help me on the platform. Oh, this is going to translate well into my actual meet day. I'll do it. And if you're not willing to do that, then like, why are you paying a coach? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Coach, I totally get that. I totally get that. You know, I was just curious because as someone who, you know, I'm not going to lie to you. I hate it. I hate cardio and I hate aerobic training. And I feel like it's easy to just hide in the like, yeah, well, I love strength training. It yeah. is easy too. But again, I had to, and I'm not going to say like, you know, once I've been with them for a year, they might start to slack off on it. And all of a sudden I see that box that day is like somehow never checked off. And I'm like, what? And I had to remind them why it's important. That totally happens. But like, once I kind of remind them and say, hey, like I'm watching, I'm waiting to see it. Yeah. I'm not going to give you a check until I see it. Like, they're like, fine, fine. Like, let me go do it. Like, yeah. Yeah. I also think too, that that's a good way to, to remind people. I think people segment in their mind, like I got my strength training day and my cardio day, not recognizing that, listen, they work synergistically together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, do you, have you ever had to deal with, I want to be mindful of your time. So this will be our last question. Uh, do you ever have to deal with you know, overtraining, right. Or dealing with the, you know, diminishing returns. That's so, so far, I have not really had too many clients seem to be in overtraining, but overreaching sometimes when I'm not supposed to have an overreach. Yes, it's definitely happened. And especially with the years that I've been coaching, I'll say specifically last year when I was working with newer clients, then I remember that I would sometimes go a little too long before giving them a deload and I could tell because their, their um, numbers just dramatically would drop, like dramatically. It was like, oh, like today's RPE, like it was the same RPE as last week, but they did like 15% less. And I, that's me learning the hard way because I would look at that and look at like the stuff they're putting next to about their stress and their sleep and blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, it's not the outside world. I think I need to adjust my training for it because like everything's just dramatically dropping. And then once I gave them a deal, they're like, oh my gosh, I feel so much better. I'm like, ooh, we might've went a little too long. <laughs> so definitely something that I had to learn, like deloads are something that is so important. And a deload too, I will say this last thing. A lot of people think of a deload as, oh, cool. This week I'm going to do like 50% of my more max for like sets of five, like super, super low intensity, um, like barely moving. It's so easy. You don't have to think about it. That doesn't have to be your deload. You know, a deload could just be that you only dropped about like 20 pounds in your squats. So like, it's not like it's so easy. You can do it with your eyes closed or it's like a warm up set, but it's just a little bit lower intensity. That's it. And some people are always like, oh, it has to be so easy. So, so light. That like, it's like, I'm moving just the barbell. Like that's, that is a deload, but it doesn't have to be that drastically easy of a week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Deload can still be challenging. Mm -hmm. Challenging, but just definitely not, not pushing you too much. Yeah, challenging, but not at the boundary. Do you have to deal, and I, you did, uh, I know I said it was last question, but this will be six seconds, okay. Is that, you know, do you ever have to deal with, you know, client buy-in like how do you deal with monotony and you know oh this again 16 weeks and I've already been squatting like I've done a kajillion absolutely yes I deal with that where the person's like oh I want to just like change it all up 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, and when that happens, I'm like, let's remember what our goal is. Mm -hmm. But also at the same time, like if we're really far off from a meet, we can do a little bit, a little bit more of switching it up. But we have to remember that the more I switch something up doesn't mean the better I get. It just means the less bored I am. That's all it means. Yeah. You just don't want to be bored that I can get you a little bit less bored. But I'm going to tell you, if you're not bored at all, there's probably a problem. Mm. you have brick around itis all right i'm gonna give you a week of fun and then we can come we gotta rein it back in because i can't have you doing like just box jumps and lateral lunges and like random stuff and i'm like but we never touched the barbell and the barbell is kind of important <laughs> yeah yeah yeah. i i feel like that is an industry i feel like it's an industry thing right the industry teaches us that like oh come to this like bobby boot camp come to this mm-hmm like bouncy bounce summer game like I went I worked at a gym where they had like kangaroo class and you're like what oh I need the muscle confusion so I can make the results I can get the results if I confuse the muscle like the muscle isn't it's not gonna get confused like what are you talking about (laughs) muscles don't have a brain I forgot about muscle Muscle confusion yeah that that was a thing I forgot that was a thing oh my gosh I'm dying okay so for those of uh, you who want to learn more about powerlifting want to potentially uh work with you hang out with you where should I send them yeah so my Instagram Solana underscore lifts so S-O-L-A-N-A underscore L-I-F-T-S and then also just email me at solanalewis.pt at gmail.com. And very soon we'll have our website up, Beverly. So that's in action coming up, but there's no name yet. It's okay. Be on the lookout on my Instagram. Yeah. And you also have your, your warm up, right? That you have that like PDF warm up people can get, right? Tell us. Yes. I totally have a downloadable PDF that is a bench press or upper body day warm up. So people can actually understand that if you do some good movements and get your muscles in a better position, you're probably going to have a much better day underneath the barbell. Okay, awesome. So we'll be sure to link all that up in the uh, show notes and we'll update it too when that website's up and ready as well. Awesome. Yes, you will. (laughs) Solana, thanks so much for hanging out with us today. I really appreciate it. I loved it. Thank you. Thank you so much for hanging out with us today. If you haven't already, be sure to hit subscribe hit like and share this video with your friends and I'll catch you on the next video.